So uh, welcome to Tech Weeklies here, I think August 2nd. We actually have two talks today. We have a secret talk coming up after mine. And I'm going to be talking today about open source documentation. So my name is James Stone. I work here in the Helsinki office at Futurist. And I'm going to be talking today about how to improve your open source documentation. And this is kind of a little bit of a remix of a talk I gave at Docs Thursday. Did anyone go to any of the Docs Thursday events here at Futurist? All right, we have one. Awesome. So, so we had a couple of events where we worked on open source software. And this is the talk I gave there. And I kind of recreated a little bit for a different format. And I'm hoping it's going to kick off again. It's a really fun thing where you just get together, kind of like Taco Tuesday, but you work on open source documentation. I'm going to start out by talking a little bit about maybe philosophy or how to think about documentation, especially when it comes to software. And a lot of what I'm going to talk about in this presentation is kind of based on some different talks, some different articles I read about technical writers as well as developers. How can we create better documentation? And at the end of it, there's a whole bunch of resources where I've summarized all the articles and different tools. So if you're interested, there'll be a link at the end. So. This is first one by a talk by Carolyn Stransky, and this idea of like the tool versus the code. And I think this is really important for open source software. There is certainly open source software where it's only used as code, right? Like maybe an NPM package where you import it, and it's not really a tool by itself. But I think a lot of open source software is also a tool, right? So this idea of who's using it, how are they using it? And I think as developers, we often assume that people are just interested in the code. But we should also be interested in the people who are coming to use our software just as the tool. Right? They might not be interested in the code behind it. They're just trying to solve a problem. So in this picture, we have an ax. Maybe the person using the ax doesn't really want to know how the ax was made, out of which wood, with what kind of machinery. And, and the other kind of important distinction to make is this like UX versus CX, and, and CX is kind of a loaded term. <laughs> Maybe I made that up. But that's the contributor experience. So when you look at readme files, often there's a lot of emphasis on getting people to contribute to the open source software, and less emphasis on the user experience. People actually want to use the software. The other thing I want to emphasize as I go through some of these techniques and how to start is the same techniques apply for internal API docs, public commercial products, or a side project. This is kind of paraphrased from a talk called The Art of Documentation by Ben Hall. But I totally agree. So the same kinds of things you can learn or practice in open source software, the same things apply when you're working with commercial software. How do you get started documenting? I have a list of ways that you can kind of get started. So if you're interested in this talk and you want to get started, these are some good ways to get started. So the first one is your own open source project. And I put Spice program here, which is a program we have at Futurist where we get compensated to contribute to open source software of our choosing. Does anybody here have an open source software project of any type? One, two, three, four, five, five. It's, it's like quite a few people here. OK, great. Also, you can use an open source project of a buddy. So if you have a friend who has one, so if you saw someone raising a hand, you can get involved with helping them to document their project. Um, a project that you love but could use some love. So I know I have some stuff that I use that, that's really exciting for me, but sometimes the documentation isn't so clear, especially for new, newer users. A hobby or a personal interest-based project. So it doesn't even necessarily have to be code-focused for you to document and teach people how to do something, like in your hobby. You can also go and get one of the public Futurize projects on GitHub. It's a great, really great place to start. And uh, I was talking to Fotis, and he reminded this, me of this, this idea of this readme-driven development. Does anybody know what this is? It's kind of like TDD or BDD. Now we have RDD. And it's kind of this lean thinking. Before you even start writing any of the software yourself, you start with the documentation. You start to document, like, how is this a great tool? How will it be used? And it helps you to kind of flesh out and figure out with your users what should be written in the first place. So it's kind of like documentation before writing the code. And since I gave the talk before, I put maybe in the front. But um, Rand McKinney had some ideas of uh, 
what are some good starting points? And that we had a really interesting discussion, and there were some disagreements about some of these. So I thought I might show them to all of us, and we'll decide quickly, do, do we agree with these as good starting points? So the first one is the GitHub readme. The second one is using a GitHub wiki, which he called it like an optional MVP. And I put a note here that it wasn't popular with developers. So I know I'm kind of biasing you a little bit. <laughs> uh, and the third one was a static site generator. So what, what do you think? Are these good entry points? Are there any that you think maybe you're not good? They get a readme? It's good or bad? It's good. It's good, okay. Does anybody disagree that their readme is good? Bare minimum. Yeah. And what about GitHub wikis? Does anybody have a GitHub wiki that they're actively using? One. Yes. Okay. Awesome. Okay. What do you use your GitHub wiki for? Yeah. So just to summarize, if you're online and you didn't hear, but you're using the wiki mostly kind of for personal notes, and you said the developer experience isn't as good as it could be. Yeah. But yeah. And um, <laughs> this was kind of the idea. Like the, there weren't a lot of people using wikis or People thought, I'll just build my own static site generator. Like we went to like full on engineering mode after the README. So I, I revised these ideas and I, I call this revised good starting points. But I thought the first one's the GitHub README. The second one, which might be thought of as like a step after you have the bare minimum of the README, is to automatically publish the README with GitHub pages. Has anyone done this? It's, it's super easy. You can literally just publish that as a website. And it's all automatic. And then you can start to expand that with you know, additional readme files that are in like a documents directory. And then I said optional static site generator of your choice. And I think often we kind of jump to the static site generator, trying to make it beautiful, thinking about a whole website and the experience, right? But starting with the readme is kind of a good way to flush out all the ideas and get the documentation really clear. And the website should just kind of give a better interface and maybe expand on those ideas. So Rand McKinney said, a good readme is table stakes. So you said it's kind of like the minimum. But he's saying it's like, if you, if you don't have a README, you can't even play. You can't even come to the table. So if you have your software, there's no README, you're done. You can't even play at the table. So th that's my interpretation of it. I think it's an interesting thing to think about. Another quote that I had was from Ben Hall. He said, the README is equally as important as a product's homepage. And I would say for developer-focused products where there's software involved that you use, wh what do you think? Is, is it equal? Do you think the README? It's a bit controversial to think that like a single text document is as important as a web page. But it's interesting to think of it that way. OK. And continuing from his thoughts, Ben, he says you've got five minutes to hook people. Right? What, what do they want to know? They're, they're, they're going to have this like state, right? They're going to come confused. Like, has anyone ever gone confused through README files and GitHub? Like, like, what is this? Like, I, like, maybe you have a problem. Just Maybe you don't even know what the problem is, but you came to something, maybe on Twitter. You go to it, and you're like, wait, what is this? You're confused about it. Like, your state of mind isn't so clear. It's not so precise. Also, you try to understand what problem it solves. Like, has anyone used software where it wasn't clear what problem it solved? Yes, at least one. OK. I know sometimes like, I feel like I'm getting really deep into the philosophy, and I'm like, OK, so what, what's the problem? Like, I understand the ideas behind it, but I'm, I'm trying to figure out like, a practical problem it's solving. Um, the other thing that people want to do is they want to quickly experiment with it. And, and I'll emphasize this, because several people said this like once. So if you're evaluating software to use, commercial product or not, or maybe in your own personal projects, like really you want to get it working as quickly as possible, like once and see if it solves the problem, right? Like maybe you don't initially need it to run a hundred times, but at least once. And the other thing is, how do you showcase the value to the people, right? In this five minutes. And and I would say it's not features, like this is often the emphasis, like here's all the features of what it does. So if we're thinking about sales, right, there's like benefits or value, but really explaining to the user in their own mindset. What kind of value is this going to provide you? All right. I thought this was really interesting, and it's really worth watching his talk. He actually did research and, and kind of an evaluation of 200 readmes of very large software projects um, across GitHub. 
and it's Daniel Beck. And 17% of them forgot to include the project name, right? And, and it's interesting, you might think, oh, well, that's not a problem, you're on GitHub, right? The project should be obvious, but you know, if you do Git clone, you can rename it, you might lose the project name. Like, how would you even know what it's called, right? If you were given it, like, on a, you know, USB stick or found it in some sort of repo, you might not have any idea what it is. 31% don't describe the project at all. Right, so 31% of the 200. 46% are missing the project location. So like if you wanted to go read more current documentation or find out things about it, you'd have no idea other than researching it yourself. And in general, kind of the summary was they often had way too much information. So it wasn't that the readmes had no information, they just had the wrong kind, in his opinion. All right. There's also a document called the Readable Readme, and he talks about the confidence building Readme. You want to identify the project quickly. You want to be able to evaluate. You want to be able to use the project again once, right? So what's the simplest way you can get someone started to use the software? And then later you want to get people to engage with the project. And again, like this emphasis on the contributor experience, a lot of GitHub repos, a lot of readmes are going to emphasize this, right? So they always talk about getting involved. Here's all of the developer options. This is how you contribute. And that's maybe kind of like the last thing you should come to, right? You want to make it really easy to use for your users of the tool first. And then contributors is something you come to kind of later on, or at least less emphasized in your readme. So I also have a list of content that you probably would want to have in your readme. This isn't exhaustive, but it's a good kind of checklist to think about. The first one's a getting started tutorial. This is also about kind of getting people to use it quickly, like one time, right? It could be code pen, code sandbox, like what's the simplest way that people can play around and, and try it? The next one's the installation. This is often coming first, but maybe it's not the most important thing, perhaps, right? The third thing to use is a summary. Why would you use this software and what problem does it solve? So like coming to a state of confusion, you really want to really clearly articulate to people concisely like what problem is it solving. Related resources, so further reading. Links to contributors and license files. And I would say choose, choose license if you haven't. Um, the list of maintainers, core teams, contributors. And I added this recently, but I think philosophy is actually an interesting thing to add into your documentation. If there's some emphasis of philosophy, because at least right now, especially in the JavaScript ecosystem, there might be competing packages. It may not be so clear, like it might be, you can talk about value, but it might not be so clear to people why. And if you get into the philosophy, like for example, like Redux, I think they really kind of get into the philosophy of like why things are a certain way. So I think that's a good thing to emphasize, but again, probably not the first thing on the readme. This is something I get excited about too. I think I may be a designer at heart, but, but you can have design, right? We, it doesn't have to just be a text file. And this is a quote, um, I don't see the person here, but I have a link to the source. But they say basically, there's this idea of excitement generators. They can be lovely touches of thought, thoughtfulness in the design, but also things like language of the product uses and the personality has. And so I think it's kind of loaded, like how do you understand that it's like super abstract? So I wanted to give an example. And I think unfortunately, I don't know that I can play the audio from the video, but I wanted to play a short video that's from a website that describes a product. And even though it's not open source software, maybe think about it through the lens of software and what are they talking about? And those questions that we had, right, when we came with a state of confusion, can we answer those questions? So I'll turn on the closed captioning here because the audio is not working. So they're working with the camera. They're going through all the steps necessary to get a great shot. And then they're introducing their solution. They built a better way. 
How does it work? You connect it to your camera, you install it on your phone, and then you shoot the pictures. And he, he talks a little bit now about how they're doing it, right? How he came from an engineering background, how they're using AI to solve the same kinds of problems that have kind of plagued photographers for years, right? They're showing how it's being used. And so even though like, we don't actually physically have this device and, and we may not be photographers, we can quickly kind of understand what is it that this does and what kind of problem that it solves, right? It takes away the complexity from normal like DSLR photography. Okay. So I think we, we can answer the same kinds of questions, right, that we would have from a readme from this video, and obviously it would help if we had audio to, to hear. But the name of the project, so it's called Arsenal, right, and it, it should be obvious if you hear it and see the logo. And what kind of problem does it solve? It reduces the complexity of photography. How does it solve it? It solves it through AI and through engineering. And how do you get started quickly once? And, and I think in this, the metaphor doesn't really apply because how could we get started? I mean, I guess maybe you could go to a store and try it and plug it in. But you can kind of see how it works even though you're not actually using it. And how can you get more involved? I didn't play all the way through, but they say go to Kickstarter to buy it. So if you're interested in any kind of the topics here, again, I'm going to flip through some of the resources, kind of further reading, and you can go much deeper. But what can you do, like, if you're interested in improving the documentation on your project? You can find a project, find a starting point, right? The README is probably the first place to start. And then I give you this hashtag, write the docs. This is a bunch of technical writers and conferences they have. And so you can check out this hashtag, or if you post something, you can publish that or you can come to Docs Thursday and write some docs with all of us. So I'm going to flip through. These are some of the resources. I summarized all of the articles and videos that I went through and also some tools that you can use. And all of the slides from the previous talk as well as all the information is at github.com jamestone co docs thursday. So you can go ahead and check that out. And that's it. Thank you. So how do you best organize a documentation? Um, you know, do you provide like sections in the beginning or different fonts or, you know, to navigate through the readme? Yeah. So, so if you didn't hear, the question was, how do I organize documentation in the readme? Like, do I use different fonts or what do we do? So if you don't know Markdown or you're not a developer, it might sound strange what I'm talking about, but we use these special ways to create headings. So I think Usually what you want to do is, is kind of start simple, and you might think of it like an outline, right? If you're writing a paper or something like that with the main ideas. So, right, we had like this idea of the getting started tutorial, installation, like I went through all those different ones. Those would make really nice headings. And then if you had enough information within them, you might create subheadings of those. And I think as you get more and more in-depth and more detailed with documentation, it makes sense to not just keep expanding the README infinitely, because it's going to get harder to read. So then you might organize it into like a docs directory and start to name them with different files. And that's where you start expanding to build a website or expand what those documents are. Yeah. And, and if you're wanting to, there's all sorts of automation where you can automate this. And you could actually create a bunch of separate files, have it build a table of contents, and build the README. So you don't have to maintain it by hand. So, are there any other questions?